Hello everyone. I'm going to talk you through uh, a Unit 2 paper, a Paper 2 from the CIE International A-Level Examination. The uh, paper we're looking at is the first year of A-Level. Um, I set it last week as a task to do. I'm, I'm going to be honest, I'm a little disappointed at the sort of low number of responses I got from that piece of work. It is still important to carry on doing um, doing your work. It's uh, it's partly because it helps to to inform the final sort of predicted grade I can submit to the exam board, um, albeit it's not the only thing I use. Um, but also, you've got to remember that this is also for your mental health. It, it sounds it sounds weird, but actually, if you think about it, lockdown started at the end of March. If you're not engaging with with, with the work. What happens is you get to university in late September and you find that you've become incredibly rusty because you've because you've um, you've not you, you might not have done these things you know throughout April, May, June, or July, and then August. So you're looking at five to six months. Uh, so it's really important that you do continue doing that work. It's really, really important. I know that times are challenging you have to work from a screen and, and write it down on a piece of paper and then take a photo and then upload it to show my homework but it's worth doing it's it's part of, it's part of what helps to keep you sane and keep you occupied um, as I know many of you are, are living in countries where there is uh, effectively a lockdown as there is in the UK at the moment that's all I'm going to say about that so today's task is to make sure you've gone back to that previous show my homework um, uh, task, downloaded the paper, and what I'd like you to do is to make sure you've got a copy of the paper in front of you. Uh, if you if you can't do that, then you will have to just keep pausing. But I'm going to like to watch this video. I'm going to talk you through each question. Now I'm going to dwell on a few where I have had some papers back. I'm going to dwell on a few um, on a few cases where really there needs to be just a little bit more explanation and just a few exam tips as well this is useful because even if you've uh, you you feel you've completed your a level in, in physics um <clears throat> uh, you will probably be going off to university and as a result you will be you'll be having to pass exams so exam technique is is also very very important here right so without any further ado i'm going to switch my camera over to my desk camera and if I go to that one, there we go. Right, so we've got, the, this is the June 2015 uh, paper th um, version three of paper two. Um, and so I'm going to make my model answers here. End of period two. So we always keep our, our data table to one side. We, we keep that handy in a, in a real exam. But we're going to start off, first of all, on question number one. Now, the first one is all about units. The distance between the sun and earth is 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11 meters. State this distance in gigameters. So giga is 10 to the power of nine, okay? So that's 150. So you can literally go into your calculator and you can type in 1.5 times 10 to the power of 11 divided by 10 to the power of 9 and it will give you 150 that's that's when I do it by calculator I do it by looking at the power number here if the difference between 11 and 9 is 2 so it's times 10 to the power of 2 so it's 1.5 times 10 to the power of 2 which is 150 gigameters <clears throat> distance from the center of the earth to a satellite above the equator is 42.3 megameters that's million meters 10 to the power that's times 10 to the power of six this radius of the earth the radius of the earth is 6380 kilometers so that's 6.38 times well, that would be times 10 to the power of three wouldn't it and then we've got kilos turns into another another three so that's 10 to the power of six meters okay and i've not even answered the question but these things ought to be ought to be becoming automatic by now it says calculate the time taken for the micro signal to travel to the satellite and back so what have we got to do here well we have to think about it for a second so what we've got is basically speed is the distance over time okay the distance here is going to be 
Well, that's, that's times 10 to the power of six. That's also times 10 to the power of six. So we've got to take that into, into consideration. <clears throat> so it's going to be the difference between these two. So it'll be 42.3 because that's the distance between the satellite and the center of the Earth. So that's the center of the Earth. There's your satellite. Okay, that is the distance, but that is that distance. And it tells you the radius of the Earth is that distance. Okay, so it's the difference between the two. So it's gonna be subtracted times 10 to the times 6.38. Now, because they've got the same common factor there, I could take it outside, take that factor outside the brackets. It just makes calculation a little bit easier. Divided by, well, if I want to work out the, if I want to work out the time, <coughs> it's going to be, rearrange it, it's going to be distance over the speed. So the distance is going to be 42.3 six point three eight all times ten to the power of six over well, what's v what's the speed well this is where your data sheet comes in handy your data sheet shows you somewhere the speed of light in free space three times ten to the power of eight meters per second so that's three point naught times ten to the power of eight meters per second Quick double check before I do my calculation. Have I done this correctly? Hang on. What the time taken for the microwave to travel, signals travel to the satellite and back. So it's got to go from the surface of the Earth to the satellite and back. So we're going to want two times all of that because it's traveling there and back. Very common mistake in the, in the examiner's report, I believe. Um, so we're then work it all out well it comes out to be um 0 0.24 seconds roughly was well, two three nine but i'll say two point two four because everything really works well, three significant figures so i should say three nine shouldn't i okay but oh, that, that'll do nicely <clears throat> the speed of a sound wave through a gas where they've given density is given by a formula you know what's coming up next you know this is a question one from a paper two so this will be all about units you guess c is a constant c hasn't show that it has no units so you don't get a mark for, for actually saying it's got no unit but you're expecting that to be your answer so the first thing you have to do is rearrange that to make c the subject so first thing to do <clears throat> is square everything okay that's not a p that's a row by the way so if you want to work if you want to rearrange that to make c the subject we're going to, do, we're going to multiply both sides by row so that's then multiplied by itself which is one and divide both sides by p then it goes into um it goes into unit into unit territory so v is a speed so that's meters per second Rho is the density, that's kilograms per meter cubed. And pressure, now you've got to be careful, pressure is equal to force over area. Now I know force is MA, so that then becomes mass is in kilograms, Acceleration is in meters per second squared. Okay, over the area, which is gonna be in meters to the minus two. So that would be kilograms, meters to the minus one, seconds to the minus two. Have I got that right? Double check. Pressure is force over area, MA, kilograms meters per second squared, meters squared. That looks right to me, so let's just try that out then. So we've got V squared. So v, if V is meters per second, V squared is in meters squared per second squared. Okay, you've got to square the units. So that's meters squared, seconds to the minus two, <clears throat> times rho, which is kilograms, 
meters per meter cubed divided by P. So the units are one over P. Well, I could, put it, I could put it as a denominator, I guess, just as easy. Kilograms, meters to the minus one, seconds to the minus two. So the kilograms cancel, seconds to the minus two cancel. Well, those two become meters to the minus one, which also cancels. Okay, so you've shown, you, when you're showing, you've got to be very, very clear. The examiners are looking for the identif correct identification of units for, for speed, density, and pressure. They're looking for the rearrangement and substitution of those units into here, particularly. Underline all the scalar quantities. Scalar, have no, scalar quantities have no direction. That's just energy and power. The acceleration, you can, well, you can have acceleration in different directions. Momentum, we know that the law of conservation of momentum from applying that, that's the momentum's got direction. The weight is just a force. The force always has direction. So it's going to be energy and power. So next one, you've got a boat that travels, um, that travels across a river that is moving at a speed of 1.8 meters per second. Uh, it says in the, in the water bed, the speed of the boat is three meters per second. I've got a feeling, um, okay, it's still, it's, it's okay. I, I, I thought Zoom had frozen for a second. Um, in the still, in the water bed, the, sorry, in still water, the speed of the boat is three meters per second. So it's moving in that direction at three meters per second. Is the boat is direct an angle of 60 degrees to the riverbank. It says on figure 1.1, draw a vector triangle or a scale diagram to show how the resultant velocity of the boat and then determine the magnitude of that resultant velocity. So we need a ruler and a protractor. Been nagging all year about this equipment and the, the number of people throughout my 20 plus years as a teacher you say, oh, we don't need all that. No, they'll, they'll lend us it in, in the exam if we need it. Well, don't, don't count on it. All right, and if boat travels across the river, so we've got, we got that information, we know that we need to draw a vector triangle or a scale diagram to show the resultant velocity of um, a boat. That's supposed to be the idea. So the boat is traveling, so the river is traveling at 1.8 meters per second that way. So I'm gonna pick, well 1.8 times two would be about 3.6, that, that would fit quite nicely. So we could draw a vector triangle, 3.6 millimeters long, sorry, 3.6 centimeters long, and that is that one. And then three, uh, two times three is six. So I'm gonna plot a line at 60 degrees. This is where being able to use your protractor and draw accurately is really important. And that's at 60 degrees, so that would be there. I'm trying to go that way. Okay, I'll draw it six centimeters exactly. Doesn't matter if it goes into the text, the examiner doesn't mind. There we are. Label it VW for water, velocity of the water, VB for the velocity that the boat's trying to push. Okay, so it's direct as an angle. So it's final vector going to be the resultant. Now I've drawn it to scale, so I'm going to put my scale on there. So that's my scale that I chose, two centimeters and one meter per second. So you draw it to scale very, very carefully. I've measured that to be 60 degrees. <clears throat> And then it says, I've got to determine the magnitude of the resultant velocity of the boat. So it's literally the length of that arrow. So I'm going to be very careful here. It's going to be really, really precise, as precise as I possibly can be. And that might make that 5.2 centimetres. 
So R corresponds to 5.2 centimetres. So if that's 5.2 centimetres, I've got to divide it by 2. So 5.2 divided by 2, because I've got 2 centimetres to, to each metre per second, is equal to 2.6 metres per second. So there is your answer. Okay, it's as simple as that. It's just, it's literally doing a scale drawing. The key part here is the scale drawing. The examiner wants to see what you've drawn. So you set your scale, you draw it as accurately as you possibly can. The common mistake that people make is, is they assume that that's a right angle. If you look, if you look carefully, when you come to do your own, you'll realize that's slightly less than 90 degrees. I can show you. Put my tractor there, you see it's about 85 degrees about five degrees off. So it's not a right angle triangle. Uh, a most common mistake that candidates made with this was trying to use Pythag uh, Pythagoras theorem. That was not quite what, what the examiner was after. That's question one. Question number two. Um, this one was generally well answered, so I'm gonna go through it reasonably quickly. Um, it says you've got the variation of time t with velocity of the ball, shown in figure 2.1. So you've got the velocity going up here, then going down and actually then being negative. So use figure 2.1 to describe without any calculation the velocity of the ball from zero to 16 seconds, so from here to here. So obviously wants the two parts of the journey here, and it's two marks. So now you've got to be careful. It's not enough to say the velocity is increasing. Yes, it's increasing, but it's a straight line. So it's a constant acceleration. So from zero to eight seconds, that first eight, that first eight seconds, it's going to be constant acceleration. Right. The next one is you've got a negative acceleration. It's still constant. So it's doing what's the comparison of velocity. So this will be zero. This one is now eight seconds to 16 seconds. Here you have a negative acceleration. Or deceleration. Okay. Okay. And that's and that's enough. I personally, when I'm answering this question, when I did this sort of myself for the first time without looking at the exam uh, the exam's mark scheme to check it, I actually put an extra detail. I said that the I actually said that the that that, the, that it changed direction at uh, at 10 seconds. But then, of course, when you read the brief of the question, it just wants to know what's happening to the velocity. Describing what's happened to the velocity it doesn't want explanations or anything else. So on to the next question. You have to use figure 2.1. Use that graph to determine the displacement of the ball from P, uh, from P at T equals 10 seconds. So at 10 seconds, you've basically got a triangle in there. So it's the area under the graph. Okay, so again, this is an exam. We're not just answering the question, we're showing an examiner that we can answer a question. So it's the area from t equals zero to 10 seconds. And now you can start saying it's a triangle. So it's a half times five, that's the height, and the base is 10. So it's a half times five times 10. So five times 10 is 50 multiplied by a half would give you um, 25 meters. Okay. The example was after particularly the fact that it's the area under the graph. So I could even call it area A and actually write that in, in here. 
just make it really clear that that's what I'm that's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at area A, which is that one. Acceleration at t equals ten seconds. So t equals ten seconds. It's the acceleration. That's the gradient of a velocity time graph. So what I would do is I'd measure the gradient. So I want to pick a nice convenient bit. Well, actually, it goes right down to minus fifteen perfectly just here. So I might as well use the whole line because I know it's absolutely straight. So I know that that is going to be from 8 to 16, so that'll be 8 seconds. And I know that's going to be 5, 10, 15, 20 metres per second. I've labelled it on the graph just to show the examiner that I know what I'm doing. So the acceleration of 10 seconds is going to be the gradient at B. Okay, so it's the gradient of B, so we know the acceleration is going to be the change in velocity divided by the change in time, which corresponds to the graph. Change in velocity is 20 meters per second. The change in time is 8 seconds. So that's going to be 20 over 8, which comes out to be somewhere in the region of 2.5 meters per second squared. One thing we've got to think about though, is the velocity going up or down? It's going down. So it's minus 20. So it's minus 20 over eight, which is minus 2.5. Okay, minus 2.5 meters per second squared. Um, for a two mark question, would the examiner penalize you for missing the minus? Well, actually it depends on the question. Start of period three. So the next part is to look at the maximum kinetic energy. So basically we know it's a half mv squared. You ought to be able to uh, remember that one in your sleep by now. Okay. And we know it's when the v is at a maximum. Okay. So v at a maximum is five meters per second. Where is, or is it? No, it's not because don't forget that it can be a negative maximum. So it'll be minus 15 meters per second. Okay. Okay. So once you've done that, you then plug in your numbers. So half times, where's the mass? Find it in the question. There it is, 400 grams. You know that should be 0 0.4 kilograms. So that would be 0 0.4 multiplied by V squared. So that's minus 15 all squared, which comes out, we're expecting a, a sort of reasonable number here. Well, I make it um, uh, 45. Okay. Then the next question says, use your answers to B1 and B2 to determine the time from T equals naught for the ball to return to P. Right. So we've got to think very, very carefully. The time for the ball, time from T naught for the ball to return to P. So we have to think very carefully. So we know so we'll think very carefully about this. So we're going to use our Subat equations. So that's going to be ut plus a half a t squared. Okay. It's going to be distance because we know the distance it travels. That's the area. So it wants you to use your answer to B part one, which is this bit up here. And it wants you to use the uh, deceleration.
So if we think about it, we can do it in reverse. So we're using, so we can rearrange that. We end up with t squared equals 2s over a. So t is equal to is equal to two times two. Oops, I've got to rearrange it, haven't I? So I need to make um, need to make. Do I need to make? No, give me x. No, I've done the rearranging. So it's two times by the distance s, which we said was twenty five, divided by the deceleration. So if you think about it, it's got it's got to go back another twenty five meters backwards. So that would be. 15, I'm going to ignore the minus sign, and we end up with um, we end up with t is equal to 2. Point, is equal to 50 over 15 square rooted, gives you 14.5 seconds. Okay, now I've paused delivery quite a lot in there because I want you to do some thinking. Did I use the equation correctly? Did I get that answer right? Have I skipped a step? That's something I'd like you to do. So on to question number three, define power. Define power, now gotta be careful. It's not enough to just say energy over time. We have to use correct terminology and this is a question on dynamics. So we know that power is equal to the work done or energy transferred, but this is mechanics. So it's definitely, we definitely will say work done, not energy transferred over time taken. And that's all you really need to add on there. So, it then says you've got a car traveling at 22 meters per second on the horizontal road. You've got a speed of 20 meters per second. There's a resistive force, which is all friction and everything else at 1,200 newtons. You've got the mass of the car, you've got the resistive force. Um, <clears throat> It says calculate the force required force F required from the car to produce an acceleration of 0.82 meters per second squared. So we've got to think very, very carefully. We know that F equals MA, but actually that F is actually F minus the resistive force. So it's the resultant force on the car. Okay. So we now know that F, the force from the car, has got to be the accelerating force plus the force overcoming friction. Okay, so the mass is 1,500 multiplied by the resistive force of, uh, sorry, multiplied by the acceleration of 0 0.82 plus the resistive force of 1,200. So we calculate all of that, we end up with two, three, so two, four, three, zero newtons. But I want to be careful here. How many significant figures am I given here? I've given two. So just out of correctness sake, I'm going to say 2,400 newtons. That should do nicely. But I'm going to keep that number in reserve in case I have to use it again. <clears throat> calculate the power required to produce acceleration. Well, power is force times velocity. So the force is, I'm going to use my more precise value, multiplied by my velocity, which is 22 meters per second, which then gives you, well, that's five, three, 500 roughly. So I would say 5,000, yeah, let, let's say five, three, 500. That should do it. Okay. Spots. It then says the resistive force on the car is proportional to V squared, where V is the speed of the car. So just why the car has a maximum speed. Right, so it says the resistive force is proportional to V squared. Where is okay, so it's the point where well, there's a maximum speed. So we'd say that at the maximum speed, V squared is such that it is equal 
to the force from the engine. So we want to, what do they call it? The, for, the force required to the uh, maximum force. From the engine. resultant is equal to zero so acceleration is zero okay that's all they want they don't want any more than that they've only given you two lines and they've only given you yeah, a, a lot in one one mark for this so that's all they really want right on to the next one number four now you've got to think about what you would use to measure things like diameter you've got so this is a sorry this is a, um, a question about uh, young's modulus okay so you think about the Young's modulus experiment. I, I believe I remember setting that as a, as a task that was to look at cells apparatus. Um, really, we just need to be yeah, yeah, fairly sort of basic about this. Well, a diameter, we know we'd use a micrometer. Okay, or well, micrometer screw gauge. Length, well, that's going to be matter of meters, so we'd use a tape measure or a ruler. A long rule, I suppose. Um, the load F, well, you would use uh, um, a Newton meter, a force meter, I suppose. Okay, and measure the extension, well, you'd use cells apparatus, um, but basically cells apparatus is just another type of micrometer, it's just specialized. Okay. So then it says, explain why a series of values f, each with corresponding acceler ex extension, are measured. So why would so? In other words, it's really asking why are we going to draw? Why would they draw a graph? So the whole point is, if you've got a series of values of the of the force, each with a corresponding ex extension, is measured because it tells you it's it's changing it from um, from five up to thirty in five newton steps. Well, the, why do we take lots of readings? Well, that's pretty simple. It reduces the effect of random errors. And that's all you really need because it's a one mark question. You could say that it's, um, you could, it's so you can plot a graph um, to check for zero error in the measurement, you could uh, say that you'd do it to check you've not, you've not exceeded the limit of proportionality. Lots of things you could actually say here, but this is probably the most basic, simple answer. It then says, explain how a series of readings and the quantities given could be used to determine Young's modulus of material. A numerical answer is not required. So what they're after is the idea that if you draw, if you get your gradient, um, Maybe I see the reading. Just determine Young's modulus of material. Numerical answer for E is not required. So once you've well, got lots of different readings of F, that's obviously something you can set. An extension is something that you can quite easily uh, measure. So you would plot. Well, there's a couple of different ways of doing this. You could say that uh, you could plot F against extension. So. Since the Young's modulus is going to be uh, F L over A E, well E for extension. They, they've used E in the table, so I'm using E here. Um, we know that that's going that's going to then basically imply that F equals um, E A E over L. Okay, where E is the Young's modulus, Y equals MX plus C. Okay, so you plot your graph of force versus extension, and you'd know that your gradient would be equal to um, EA over L. So if you want to find the, the, the Young's modulus, E is the gradient. Times L 
over that cross-sectional area. Well, we don't know the cross-sectional area, so we want to be really, really precise. Right, it's pi r squared, which is pi, we've got the diameter here. So we do d squared. Well, it's d over two, isn't it? So it's d over two all squared, which is a quarter pi d squared, because a uh, uh, half squared is a quarter. So you'd actually put that there as well. Okay, and that's how you'd find the Young's modulus. Right, on to the next one. Question number five. Now, the electricity question, I think, was one that gave a few of you some headaches here. So we've got a uniform resistance wire, so we probably have something on potential differences. We've got what looks like um, a, potential di a potential different circuit in here. So we're going to probably do something to do with uh, res resistivity and, pot and uh, potential dividers. Uh, uniform resistance wires have a length of 50 centimetres and a diameter of 0 0.36 millimetres. So the radius of the wire, so the diameter of the wire is 3.6 times 10 to the power of 4 metres, minus 4 metres. Resistivity of the material, that's given in SI units, that's useful. Show the resistance of wire AB is 2.5 um, uh, ohms. So we're using R equals rho L over A. We've got the resistivity, we've got the length, we can work out the area. So the area is a quarter pi d squared. So the resistance is equal to the resistivity multiplied by the length divided by the diameter. So that's a quarter, I'll express that as a decimal, multiplied by pi, which is 3.141592655 and all the rest of it, um, multiplied by d squared, so that's 3.6 times 10 to the minus 4 all squared. And remember, you're looking for a very low number, I think. I'm sorry, you, you would be looking for a very low number for resistivity. Resistance, you're looking for sort of a, a, some whole numbers, really. Okay, so, resi so the resistivity comes out to be 2.51 ohms. Now, there's no space to write the answer, so I'm just putting it there. So that's approximately 2.5 ohms, okay? So I've shown the use of that formula, I've shown how I've got the area, substituted number, and that's enough for, for that particular proof. The wire AB is connected in series to a power supply, and the resistor R is shown in figure 5.1. The EMF is six volts, its internal resistance is negligible, good, so it's not an internal resistance question just yet. The resistance of R is 2.5 ohms, okay. Uh, I'm going to put the EMF up there because it just helps me because I'm a visual thinker. Uh, second uniform wire CD, so you've got the wire AB and a resistor wire CD is connected across the terminals. The, the wire CD has got a length of 100 centimeters, a diameter of 0.18 millimeters, so that's Okay, and that's made the same material as wire AB. Calculate the current supplied by the battery. Eee, that looks awful, until you realize something very, very sen sensible. That value is a half of that value. So that would be a half of D1, okay? That is two times the original length. So the other resistance for this one for CD <coughs> excuse me, the resistance for CD is rho L over A but if we do it in terms of L1 and D1 that's well we could do we're just going to remember to put in the four pi quarter pi D squared so that would be 
row, instead of L, instead of L, we've got two L1. Okay. Over a quarter pi times D1 over two all squared. So now that square becomes a four. What we're going to do is we're going to take that outside the brackets. You'll see why. Okay, I've taken that bit outside the brackets to leave inside here two over a quarter. So in other words, it's eight times resistance of A, B. Okay, so the resistance of A, B would therefore be um, 20 ohms. So that's 2.5 times eight gives you 20 ohms. You can use your more precise value if you want, or you can use that one as long as you show you're working carefully. Okay, so that's RAB. So we've got to work out the total resistance now of the circuit would be RAB plus 2.5, one over it, plus R, one over R, C, D, one over all of that gives you the total resistance. So if that gives you the total resistance, you then work it out, okay? So it's one over, you got one over, well, let's see, that's 2.5 plus 2.5, it's one over five, plus RCD, well, that's gonna be 20. And it comes out to be about four ohms, okay? Very, very roughly, four ohms. So then you want to work out the current. That's E over RT, which is the EMF is six. The uh, total resistance is four. That gives you 1.5 amps. Pretty easy when, when you actually do it. The bit that, the bit that makes this difficult is you have to do it in steps. So I'm gonna go back over those steps. So first of all, you've got to work out what RCD is and you do it by looking at the proportions the relative proportions um, compared to uh, RAB. However, that's one way to do it. The other way to do it, if you're really struggling with that, is, well, you're given the length and you're given the diameter, you can calculate it, it comes out to be the same. Then you want to work out the total resistance of the whole circuit. So this whole circuit is kind of looking like a resistor combination. Oops, sorry, I'm just going to squeeze that up there. I do apologize. Okay, suddenly that makes sense when you look at it like that. Okay, it's just, it's just a bit of confidence really more than anything else. Now the next part is then to calculate the power transformed in the wire AB. Well, we know there's a couple of different ways of doing it. Probably the easiest way to do it is say that power is I squared over R. You could do it that way, okay? You work out I, you can then multiply it by the uh, resistance of A to B. Then you could do it that way, so you work out what current is. Well, current's gonna be the EMF over R A B plus 2.5. So that's the total resistance. So that's going to be basically six over five, which gives you um, 1.2. So then the power is going to be 1.2 squared times 2.5, which according to my calculations comes out to be uh, 3.6. The other way to do it is to use the EMF. You could, you could use either method here. You could use the idea that power is V squared over R, okay? So that's, um, well, this V squared is V squared over R. Recognize 
that's a half E, half times the EMF, because in the resist in the calculations, you can see that the resistance of that was 2.5 ohms and the resistance of that's 2.5 ohms. So we're going to share the EMF equally. Okay, over the 2.5 ohms comes out to be, um, well, that's going to be uh, 3 squared, so that's 9. Over 2.5 comes out to be 3.6 quite happily. This one's quite tricky, unless you do a little bit of recognition. The potential difference between the midpoint M of the wire AB and the midpoint N of the wire CD. Right, what you've got to do here is go back to what the potential difference is. It's a difference in potentials. So the way to do this is to think very, very carefully. At this end, the potential is six volts. At this end, it's zero volts. When you get, when you get to, say, to here, that's then going to be, that's 2.5 ohms. Okay, and that's 2.5 ohms. So the potential here, as there's no resistance here, it could be anywhere along here, so I'm going to put it here, is equal to three volts. Okay, the potential here to here, well, there's no other resistance there, so that's going to be six volts. Halfway here is going to be three volts. If you think about it, that's six and that's three, that's going to be 4.5 volts. And it wants to know the potential difference between here and here. Okay. So it's the difference between 3.5 volts and 4.5 volts. So it's 4.5 minus 3 gives you 1.5 volts. Okay, so that's relatively easy to do. But the thing with this one is being able to recognize the idea about potentials. The best way to do that is when you've got a circuit, if you've got that sort of that, that kind of question, and you'll know it when you see it is to actually work out the potentials at different points. We know potential at this end here, the negative end is going to be zero. The positive end, it's going to be six. So we know that if that's half of the resistance of the total in series there, it's going to be half, the potential is going to be half of the maximum. So if that's there, the maximum there at six, halfway along will be three. Now that's going to be half, that's going to be an increment of a half again, so that'll be 4.5. So it's 4.5 versus uh, minus three. Okay, right, next one. Two overlapping waves of the same type, so the same type traveling in the same direction, the variation of their displacements is shown in figure 6.1. There's a big graph, now that tells me straight away, I'm probably gonna have to predict the shape of the resultant. And it's obviously a question about interference. So, first question, explain the meaning of coherence and interference. So coherent, the basic idea is it's, a, is it's two waves with a constant, or a wave with a constant phase difference. Many candidates wrote the, wrote this, wrote same wavelength or same frequency. That's a consequence of having to be the same phase difference. Uh, interference is the overlapping or superposition of two waves where the resultant displacement equals the sum of the displacements. Okay, it's a simple definition. You can look it up in your book. So fuse figure 6.1 6 to determine the frequency of the waves. So the first thing you need to do, if they're, if they're coherent, they're both going to have the same wavelength. So we want to have a look for that first wavelength there. So that's one, have we got that right? Hang on, double check really hard to see this isn't it 
Have I got that? No, I haven't. That's not the right place. So I maybe need to put it there, but it's really hard to see where the peak exactly is. So it's really hard to see where the peak exactly is here. So I'm going to use this wave, and I'll show you why. You can see where it crosses the axis. So that's half, one whole wave. That is where it crosses the axis. It's crossed it very exactly there. So that would be three. You can see that's going to be five, 0.5. So that's going to be 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 6, 8, 5, yeah, 2, 4. So that's 3.2 meters. Okay. So that's, uh, I'm going to say it's red from the graph. Making it really clear that that's what I've done. So that's then red from the graph. Wavelength is 3.2. Two meters but it wants the frequency and this is again when I read it when I almost fell for it myself even though I've got my notes in front of me um, it wants the frequency so you know that the speed is frequency times the wavelength so you want to find the frequency that's going to be the speed over the wavelength so the speed is 240 divided by 3.2 not three some people actually um the candidates um were very approximate and said three uh 240 divided by three is going to give me 75 hertz okay so that's then 75 hertz so the next thing we're going to do is move on a little bit here it says state the phase difference between the waves so state means you don't have to calculate it but it's pretty obvious when you think about it that's going to be well they're 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 not in phase they're not totally out of phase they're somewhere halfway between you can actually see that where that's zero the others are maximum so it's a quarter of a, it's a quarter of the uh, the wavelength and it wants it in degrees so a quarter of a circle is 90 degrees out of phase if you quote if you'd said sorry I've, I've, I've gone off the top there if you'd said pi over two radians as long as you said radians afterwards I think you'd have got the mark but you've got to be very very careful to make sure that you um, that, that you so you know, that you're uh, that you're paying attention to units so the next one says use the principal superposition to sketch the resultant wave I knew this was going to happen now the mistake that people make here is that they don't really do it properly. So what you've got to do is you've got to look at where the numbers are easy to add together. So here we've got zero and we've got two. So zero plus two is two. So I've put, I actually plot some points. Here we've got, well, this is almost exactly 1.5. So 1.5 plus 1.5, their displacements add together. It's up here. Here we've got two and zero, so that's going to be two. Here we've got, well, if we go a little bit further down here, uh, around about sort of here ish, I guess, we can start to put a midpoint in if we, if we want to. So I could say, well, okay, here it's one, and there minus 1.8, so it'd be about minus 0 0.8 ish, about there ish. Okay, so here we've got 1.5, so minus 1.5 plus minus 1.5, so that'd be about 3. Here we've got, again, well, I could put it here as, as well. I could say, well, that's going to be uh, just 2. We know that the peak's here, so that's going to be 2. Peak here, it's going to be 2. 1.5 plus 1.5 makes 3, and that'll be 2. So now you've got some points you can really sort of draw, draw your curve with. So what the exam was looking for is a sinusoid with a peak at plus three, a trough at minus three, and peaks positioned, peaks positioned at three. So I would probably get a rubber out and do that again, possibly. Peaks positioned at three and roughly where the uh, amplitudes of the two waves um, sort of cross over. 
okay? Now, I would say that you could probably do this with a few working lines. I personally use points because I, th I think it makes it easier to actually draw it. Right, moving on. You've then got an interference pattern produced with the arrangement shown in figure 6.2, so that picture, so we're now looking at two slits, uh, two source interference. Laser, so that's coherent light. You're given the wavelength. Should immediately turn that into SI units. Slits are a distance uh, 30 millimeters apart, so that's 1.3 times 10 to the minus four meters. Distance between the slits is 85 centimeters. Should be automatic, okay? Two points on the screen are labeled A and B. The path difference between S1A and S2A, so it's going from there and there, is zero. And the path difference between there is 2.5. So in other words, if you if you were to look at so, uh, sort of, if you imagine each line I draw is a bright fringe, you know you get your bright fringe here. Now it's 2.5 meters. So where it's one, you'd get another bright fringe. Where it's two, path difference is two, uh, two lambda, you'd get another bright fringe. Where it's three, you get another bright fringe, but it's actually, halfway between them okay okay should draw that more accurately okay so it then says calculate the distance a b so once you really to calculate the distance between the bright fringes so we know that x equals well we know we've got Big D lambda over, um, <clears throat> excuse me, over A, okay. So if we know that, we can then say, well, if that's the case, we know that it's gonna be, uh, big D is 0 0.85, multiplied by lambda, which is 5.46, divided by the distance A, which is, uh, sorry, 5.46 times 10 to the minus seven, divided by 0 0.1, try again, 1.3 times 10 to the minus four. Now, that would give you an X value, which is all very well and good. Give you about 3.57 times 10 to the minus three meters, about three and a half millimeters. But that distance, that's x there. So that's one x, two x, two and a half x. So the distance a to b is equal to 2.5 x. So it's 3.57 times 10 to the minus three, multiplied by 2.5, gives me by my reckoning about 8.93 times 10 to the minus three meters, okay? So it's using that formula. This is a formula, you do have to know all your formulae, but using a little bit of extra logic in there, they put a little, they put a little twist in, in this one. Then so the laser is replaced by laser emitting blue light. So what color was it before? Well, at that sort of wavelength, you're looking at red light probably, okay? Uh, so if it's emitting blue light, State and explain the change in distance between the maximum observed on the screen. So we know that the wavelength for blue light is less than, well, it's going to be less, less than the given value, 546 nanometers, okay? Now, even though it doesn't tell you it's blue, you recognize the idea that red, orange, yellow, green, blue, indigo, violet, you know, blue is at the short wavelength part of the, uh, of, of the spectrum, okay? So all the other colors are laser, well, they'd probably be red or orange or yellow or green or something, but they probably wouldn't be blue. So this one is blue, so it's gonna have a shorter wavelength. So you have to make that little bit of a leap of faith. So once we say that, well, if you think about it, if the fringe separation is proportional to lambda,
So the distance is smaller, okay? The distance is a lot smaller, okay? So they'll be closer together. That's basically it. It's only one mark. It, it wouldn't, wasn't quite enough to say smaller. Um, I would think that what you'd probably need to do was to um, was to actually explain that the, the, that the uh, wavelength of blue light is going to be less. All right, question seven, the last question. It's the radioactivity question. And again, there are some easy, there's some easy money in here. OK, so the first thing we can do is we say that what's meant by spontaneous radioactive decay well, it's the idea the rate of decay is not affected, is not affected by external physical factors, by external factors. And there's a difference between, uh, between spontaneous and random. Random means any particular atom could decay at any time. But the fact that that it is actually the, the spontaneous means it's not affected by external factors. So radioactive sources don't decay more quickly if you heat them up. Uh, they don't decay more quickly if they're if it's a concentrated substance. So it then says state the constituent particles of X. So what's this? So we got this one's bismuth two one two. So we're using. The idea that we assume that's probably photon energy or kinetic energy of particles. So X is going to be, well, we've got to make sure that these numbers match up. So, so the constituent particles of X, X is going to be 212 minus 208. And this value down here would be 83 minus 81. So that's four, that's two. So it's two protons two neutrons very easy okay how do we know this because that's because that corresponds to the proton number that's the mass which is the number of protons plus the number of neutrons okay that's pretty easy to do it then says, use conservation of mass energy to explain the release of 6.2 mega electron volts of energy in this reaction. So the idea is, is um, the fact the mass of the bismuth 212 is going to be greater than the mass of this um, of, of the daughter product. Plus the mass of the alpha particle, okay? So the idea is meant to be that we've lost some mass. So, um, well, I, I like to use the formula. So the change in mass is equal to the, is corresponds to energy. Okay, and remember, we just want to qualify this because it's a two mark question, so we just want to put a bit more in. So that that is the kinetic energy of of the door of of the of the alpha particle, let's say, of the products. And of course, photon energy. Okay. And that's basically it. That's basically it. One mark saying that there is a reduction in mass, and, that, and then that, uh, and then the other ones say the difference in mass relates to the kinetic energy of the products and or, or the gamma rays or the energy of the gamma rays produced. So then it says calculate the energy in joules released in this reaction. Now this is not an easy one. Got to think about it carefully. Well, if you think about it, all you're really doing is converting that into um, converting that into joules. So it's 6.2 mega electron volts. The same thing as saying 6.2 times 10 to the power of six electron volts. We know that one electron volt is the, map, is the charge of the electron. And again, you don't need to know the number because it is on your data sheet. So we look for the mass, we look for the charge of the electron. There it is. Okay, 1.6 times 10 to the power minus 19.
Okay, so to work out the energy in joules, it's literally 6.2 times 10 to the power of 6 multiplied by 1.6 times 10 to the power of minus 19. We're expecting a fairly small number. It comes out to be uh, 9.92 times 10 to the power of minus 13 joules. And that is how you answer that particular paper too. Now, what you need to do is if you've done the work, you need to go back over this, go through your corrections, make sure you understand why those are what those answers are the particular answers. Um, you need if you haven't done the questions, then you need to, having watched the walkthrough, give yourself and you know maybe watch it again and give yourself a bit of time to actually then try and do the question of the paper two under exam conditions and see if you see how much of it you can actually remember how to do. Okay, it's about learning techniques, it's not about learning answers. So I'll leave you with that, and that is uh, that is the paper two walkthrough.